Welcome back, editor at large of the Mail on Sunday. Charlotte Griffiths joins me now live in the studio to offer unrivaled royal insights. So I'm looking forward to this debate. So many stories to get through. And don't forget, the papers are on their way. But let's crack on with the Royal Dispatch. There you go, folks. Breaking news. Prince Andrew was spotted for the first time since the release of the Epstein files today, as pressure continues to grow on the disgraced Duke. Andrew, who has vehemently denied all allegations, was seen at the wheel of his car driving away from his home, the Royal Lodge in Windsor, after being named 69 times in the bombshell court documents. There's no suggestion that Andrew or anyone else named in documents had anything to do with the Epstein crimes or had any knowledge of them. But Charlotte, first of all, we've seen him again. What do you think this ordeal is doing to Prince Andrew on a very personal and human level? Well, on a personal level, he's at a very low ebb. OK, so that's probably obvious, but your friends are really saying, seriously, he's at a really low ebb. There are reports today that he was locked in his room for mm. a portion of this week, and Sarah Ferguson's been drafted in to double down on her wifely duty, even though they're not married. She is very much on hand non-stop to just keep him going. But having said that, on uh, Christmas Day, he was videoed in Sandringham. This video has emerged of him recently, mm. sort of berating his old own fans, and on classic Prince Andrew form, being sort of quite boorish and patronising. So, so sometimes you see a clip like that and you think, mm. well, actually, maybe he's just fine and he's just powering on through and burying his head in the sound. Mm. You know, he, didn't, he certainly didn't see, con seem contrite that day, that's for sure. He's, you know, still a relatively young man. He's a member of a family with excellent genetics. What's he going to do for the next two or three decades? I don't know. I and mean, this is the question that all of his friends have been asking. Mm. And, you know, their big worry is that he can't even really go shooting. He can't, he can't... There are some basic things that you can do if you're a sort of posh royal living in the country. And actually, he's been socially outcast from even some of those. Mm. So he's, he's... And he certainly can't do any charity work or any royal work of any kind, uh, especially now in the light of this second batch of Well, yeah, I should, should say that he was, uh, I think, named uh, 67 times in sort of 900 pages. 69 times. Documents. It was 69. Yeah, I thought it was 69. <laughs> that's the number that everyone yeah, that's, that's there. That's why I corrected it and said 69, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, you know, the bottom line is that uh, it, it's obviously very damning. He, he's not been found guilty of any of these crimes. He's settled out of court with Virginia Dufresne. Um, is there a sense that this guy is the victim of trial by media, trial by public opinion? Is there well, any ounce of sympathy for Prince Andrew? Oh, there's, not, there's not much sympathy going around. I mean, Alan Dershowitz has been quite sympathetic uh, this week and mm. said, well, you know, his mum pressured him into settling and actually, you know, he, he didn't do it and he shouldn't have settled. So, what, with Sarah Ferguson? No, with Virginia. Oh, I see. So you, you settled. Yeah, yeah, Sorry, I thought yeah, you were talking yeah. about the romantic history of Prince no, Andrew. No. Uh, settled out of... Yes, and it's, it's, the you, papers are saying today that if he'd gone to court, he would have won. He would have won. So I suppose... But, I mean, it's not like everyone's flooding to defend him in light of that. You don't really mm. want Alan to be your only supporter in this world, I don't think. So yeah. um, I think I think there isn't. But I, I know what you mean, because he's never actually been found guilty of any of these crimes, and yet there he is in purgatory, you know, locked in his room, unable to conduct his life in any way. And his pal, Lady Victoria, Victoria Harvey, a good friend of the show, mm. uh, she says that he's been done up like a right royal kipper. I know. Well, these are his two great defenders, as Lady Victoria Harvey and Alan Dershowitz. You know, they're not the most... Um, I don't know, they're not... The, reliable the best witnesses. Reliable <laughs> witnesses. I'm trying to find the most negative, um, diplomatic way of saying this. But, you know, he, that, that's it. He's got two people sticking up for him at this point. It's not, it's not many, is it? No, it most definitely isn't. Uh, Catherine is now 42. Yes. And, well, it's a pretty loaded question, but is she showing Meghan Markle how it's done? The classic Meghan versus perfect princess debate. Um, I think... I think she is so, showing Meghan Markle how it's done. There was a time in 2018, I think one of your clips showed it earlier, when Meghan and, and um, Kate were speaking together in a royal forum. Mm -hmm. And... Meghan was speaking a lot better than Kate, and it was it started to become very apparent that there was a real risk here that Meghan might outshine Kate in the public speaking arena. Mm -hmm. But what Kate's done, which is what she's brilliant at, is just stood back, stayed calm, stayed quiet, and just waited for Harry and Meghan to thrash it out, tie themselves in knots, 
throw lurid accusations her way via their royal biographer, and you know, apparently it's you know via Meghan, and and she's just stayed calm, stayed quiet, and she's emerged the victor. And you know, we always used to tease her, the tabloid media, for being weighty, Katie, but actually it's kind of a positive thing because she's just waiting it out, and she looks fabulous at 42. She's elegant. And, nobody, and nobody's bringing up the royal racist thing on her birthday today. I mean, I'm, I can imagine Meghan Markle might have expected that to come yeah. up. But it doesn't, because people sort of admire Kate and think she's fabulous. Well, well this is great news. And, and actually, it's a year since the release, the publication of Spare, and all, yeah. a lot of those, uh, you yeah. know, the sort of the, the dirty laundry being washed in public. And so she can actually enjoy this birthday in peace. And, and look back on quite a good year for Catherine, really. Yeah, she's had a brilliant year. And she's had the coronation as well, where she just looked fabulous. And, yeah, she's had a great year. And, um, you know, she's running a tight ship with her family as well. And she's getting tougher and tougher as the years go by. And, uh, you know, actually, Spare was... Spare did her a favour, because in Spare, Harry wrote every other chapter about how Meghan was on the floor crying at this or on the floor crying at that. And, you know, there's always been this narrative from Meghan and Harry's camp that Meghan's the strong one and, and Kate's the weak one. But Spare portrayed Meghan as this kind of weak, sort of flailing character on the floor. And actually, Kate is the tough one that made Meghan cry. And actually, we are getting this picture emerging of Kate as a bit of a tough cookie underneath it all. Well, indeed, I think we'd all like a reconciliation between the Sussexes and the Windsors, wouldn't we? Because these are human beings. Mm. Well, you're not so sure. <laughs> um, but but I, I would like if they could resolve things because, you know, it's, it's a shocker that Charles doesn't get to spend time with his grandchildren in California and the like. Um, if there were some kind of peace talks, do you think there's any potential for Catherine to forgive Meghan? Could those two ever be friends again? Mm, they were never friends in the first place, so I good don't with think so. I'm, Meghan, uh, I, I think Kate could probably put on a good show if she had to, a bit like when the Queen died, they had to walk around um, the crowds together. Actually, that wasn't too convincing, but she might be able to do a more convincing double act if it came to it many years down the line and they ended up doing a royal engagement together again. Uh, I think she could probably put on a good show. Whose who's fault is the sort of the, the, the division within that relationship? You know, is it, is it Catherine? Is it Meghan? Well, I think Catherine was quite cool towards Meghan and never particularly warm to her. Mm. But Meghan didn't give her any leeway for that. Meghan expected a hug on their first meeting, turned up with no shoes on. Right. I mean, if I met the future Queen of England, I wouldn't be... I'd be wearing shoes for my first meeting. And yeah. I'd wear heels, actually. Yeah, it's a, it's a, <laughs> definitely. And it's a combination of Meghan getting offended too easily and Kate not being particularly warm and fuzzy. And, and what people don't realise, and this is why I don't buy the kind of Meghan Markle sob story about the British press, OK? I've got many friends in Fleet Street. When Meghan Markle arrived on the scene, Fleet Street were delighted because mm. they found, as you mentioned, they found Kate charming but a bit dull. And they looked at Meghan and thought, there's our new Diana. Yeah. She was the one that was storyboarded for, you know all, all, you know, all of the fame and glory. So this is of her making, isn't it? Her exile and her losing out to Catherine, she can only blame herself. I think so. I don't know if we thought she was the new Diana, but we definitely thought she was going to be this amazing, well, she, she, glamorous... She made more headlines, didn't she? Oh, she did at first, because she was fresh meat. I mean, mm. that's how it kind of goes. Is it of her own making? I think it probably is, because she just, she just couldn't give it time. And that's what, that's what we were saying earlier. Kate can give things time. She has that ability to play that long game. And Meghan wasn't able to, and she just tied herself in knots and, and burned out quite quickly, you know. Mm. It kind of... Her star went like that and then down again. Before you go back to your palace, paid for by the newspaper group that you work for, um, can I ask <laughs> you about the recent poll that suggests the, uh, the royal family not quite as popular as they might once have been? I think it was below 50% support in one particular... Poll. Yes. Is this anything to worry about? And is it the fault of Prince Andrew? I'm, well, I'm sceptical about that poll for a start because it was commissioned by Republic. Mm. But say we gave it the benefit of the doubt. OK, so we are experiencing the post-Queen lull right now. Mm. So Charles has done a good job in his first year. He's made no massive clangers. Andrew's not helping matters. But I think as those young royals come up yeah. and they become incredibly glamorous... Can you imagine Charlotte in 20 years' time? She's going to be... She looks just like the Queen already. She's got wow. Kate's poise. She's the grandchild of Princess Diana. She's got Prince William as her father. You know, they'll come up and they'll grab the attention of the nation. 
situation and will fall completely in love with the whole royal family all over again. And um, so I think it's a case of giving it time. I don't think the monarchy is going to crash and burn. It's only been a year since the Queen's died. And a lot of people just associate the monarchy with the Queen. So that kind of needs to wear off, that sort of association. And people will start becoming really fond of, of uh, Prince Charles, or King Charles as the grandfather of the nation. And I think slowly, slowly those polls will start coming up again. That's a very cheery message. Uh